go to these different cities around the country, most of our speakers come from out of state. Surprisingly, we have yet another Buckeye, Haley from Columbus. I mean, this is awesome. Uh, in California, I don't think I can find one local speaker other than Bryce and myself. And, you know, uh, we're not a draw. Our next speaker from Columbus is an attorney, a law professor, an adjunct scholar of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, and a blogger for LouRockwell.com. He's the author of the extremely important book, Libertarianism Today. Please welcome Jacob Huber. How can you challenge a federal law that violates the Constitution and, more importantly, violates your liberty? Suppose, for example, you wanted to get rid of the Patriot Act or the worst parts of it. I guess you could try to elect a president who says he opposes the Patriot Act and its violations of civil liberties. Uh, if a candidate says he's concerned about the government's abuses under the Patriot Act, and if a candidate said the Patriot Act is shoddy and dangerous, and if a candidate said things like, there is no reason why we cannot fight terrorism while maintaining our civil liberties, maybe you'd vote for him and hope that things change. Of course, in 2008, Millions of Americans voted for a candidate who did say those things. But when that candidate, Barack Obama, became president, did he make good on his promise to create more oversight over the use of national security letters, which let the government go after your personal records that businesses have without telling you in secrecy? Did he make good on his promise to create more oversight, even create more oversight over sneak and peek searches where the government can go into your house without telling you, find evidence, and then go back and get a real warrant against you? No, of course not. Instead, he did the opposite. He strengthened the government's power to spy on its people without a warrant or probable cause. And he took the exact same views on government power that the Bush administration had taken, or worse. You can also try, of course, to elect a new batch of congressmen, people who say they'll respect the Constitution. Millions of Americans voted for Republican candidates who made that promise in 2010. And then what happened when the Patriot Act came up for renewal a few months later? Of course, all of these people who had been elected, who claimed to love the Constitution, who insisted on reading the Constitution aloud once, in part, when starting the congressional term, voted to renew the Patriot Act. Ninety percent of the Republicans in the House of Representatives voted to renew the Patriot Act without so much as a committee hearing, with no markups, no amendments, and just 40 total minutes of debate. And of that handful of Republicans who voted against the Patriot Act, most weren't even the Tea Party people. They were people who had been in Congress for years. Only eight of these freshman Republicans voted against the Patriot Act, and some of the biggest Tea Party figureheads who go on and on about the Constitution voted for it. No changes, no debates. When House Democrats moved to add language to the Patriot Act that would have required that intelligence probes of U.S. citizens be conducted, quote, in a manner that complies with the Constitution of the United States, end quote, only two Republicans voted for it, Walter Jones and Ron Paul. Meanwhile, the other Republicans, such Tea Party icons as Michelle Bachman, Alan West, Kristi Noem, show just how much they really care about the Constitution for all their talk. They couldn't even approve a single sentence in a law that said that the law had to be applied constitutionally. So it seems like electoral politics aren't getting us very far. What about the federal courts? They're supposed to be the guardians of our constitutional rights, aren't they? Well, they do protect some people's rights, some of the time. But if protecting your rights requires limiting federal power, don't expect the federal courts to help at all. After all, the courts give all federal legislation what they call the presumption of constitutionality. That is, they assume that the federal government can do anything it wants to you unless you can prove that they can't do it. And of course, no one can ever prove that, 
because the courts read Congress's powers so broadly. Of course, the presumption of constitutionality actually turns the Constitution upside down. If the Constitution really is intended to constrain government and protect our rights, as we're sometimes told, then all legislation should face a presumption of unconstitutionality unless the government can satisfy its burden to show that the law it wants to enforce is specifically authorized in the very short list of powers that the Constitution gives to Congress, to show that the law is necessary and proper for exercising that power, and to show that the law doesn't violate any provision of the Bill of Rights. Unfortunately, though, the presumption of constitutionality that the federal courts consistently recognize isn't going to change ever. That's because federal judges, including Supreme Court justices, are chosen by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And any person who a president would choose to sit on the court and anyone the Senate would confirm to sit on that court is going to be someone they know they can count on to let them do pretty much anything they want. It's a rigged game. And by the way, the federal courts can't get you one way, they'll get you another. When George W. Bush was president, he had the National Security Agency, Agency secretly spy on the phone calls and emails of American citizens with no warrant, no probable cause. A group of legal scholars tried to challenge the flagrant, constitution, uh, the, uh, flagrant violation of our constitutional rights. In 2007, that case came before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, uh, which sits right here in Cincinnati. That court said there's nothing they can do about it. After all, no one could prove that they were a victim of the government spying because the spying was secret. And the government couldn't say who it was spying on because that's a matter of national security. So no victim of this scheme, which everyone knew was going on and any reasonably intelligent person could see as unconstitutional, could do anything about it in the federal courts, the supposed guardian of our constitutional rights. Again, it's a rigged game. It's rigged against you and your liberties. And maybe you've noticed, by the way, when the federal government does acknowledge your liberties to some extent, it does it only really grudgingly, and it makes it as clear as it possibly can that in the end, the government has the right to do whatever it wants to do to you if it really wants to do it. Take, for example, the uh, District of Columbia versus Heller gun case, a uh, decision from a couple years ago where the Supreme Court finally, for the first time in 200 years, recognized that the Second Amendment protects an individual right to have a handgun for self-defense. Uh, you know, in some ways, that seems like a great decision. I certainly congratulate the people who fought and won that case for their heroic work. But have you actually read the decision by the Republicans' hero, Justice Antonin Scalia? It says that even though the Second Amendment does protect an individual right, the right is not unlimited and it's subject to reasonable restrictions. So what's a reasonable restriction? Well, who knows? No one knows. It's whatever the Supreme Court says it is in the next gun case. And if history is any guide, the right that the Supreme Court ultimately will recognize will be very, very narrow. With well, a lawyer arguing for the Second Amendment freedom in that case, argued before the court, he had to, when he was arguing with these guys, acknowledge, yes, the government has the power to do all these things to limit gun, gun rights, just to be taken seriously. Even while he was arguing the pro-freedom side, he had to admit that the government could reasonably stop you from owning guns the government de deems inappropriate for civilian use, uh, that it could force you to keep your guns locked in a safe at all times, uh, that it could force you to do and not do all manner of things related to owning guns without hurting anybody. Now, I'm a lawyer myself. I don't blame him for making those arguments. You know, when you're a lawyer in court, your job is to persuade judges. It's not to uh, advance uh, your personal philosophy or anything. So uh, I get that. But that's the game you're playing in federal court. At best, acknowledging that the government has the power to do whatever it wants and begging it to carve out just a little area of liberty that we're allowed to enjoy. Since you've come to a conference called Nullify Now, and you've already heard Tom Wood speak, you know what I'm going to say the only real alternative is? It's nullification, which allows the states to declare federal laws unconstitutional, 
refuse to enforce them, and protect their citizens from their enforcement. Nullification isn't about groveling before politicians and judges to get a few scraps of liberty. Nullification is about the people standing up to the federal government and simply saying no. These are our rights. This is what the Constitution limits you to. You may go no further. Nullification is the only way that someone outside the federal government, which always wants as much power as it can possibly have, no matter who's running it at any given time, can have a say as to what's constitutional and what isn't. It's the only way the people, instead of their would-be masters in Washington, can have a say as to how much liberty they'll be able to enjoy. Thanks to Tom Woods and his book, more and more people are waking up to the reality that presidents, congressmen, and judges aren't going to fix things for us, ever. And more and more people are looking to nullification as a potential solution for the government's ever-increasing intrusions on our lives. For example, just this past week, two bills were introduced in the Texas legislature to put an end to sexual assault assaults and ongoing porno scanning by the Transportation Security Administration. Will the federal government, the president, Janet Napolitano, Congress, or the courts ever put a stop to what the TSA does? Will they ever limit it? Will they ever go back instead of going forward with more intrusions on our, on our privacy and liberty? Of course they won't. The federal government never repeals anything, never rolls back anything, never strikes down anything. It only takes more and more and more from us over time. Anyway, here's what they've introduced in Texas. Uh, it's their House Bill 1938, and it says, quote, An airport operator may not allow body imaging scanning equipment, meaning any device that uses backscatter x-rays or millimeter waves that creates a visual image of a person's unclothed body and is intended to detect concealed objects, to be installed or operated in any airport in this state. It says that an airport operator who violates that provision shall be subject to a civil penalty of up to $1,000 for each day of the violation. And it authorizes the Attorney General to not only collect that penalty, but also to sue for injunctive relief. In other words, to get an order from a Texas court to stop the airports from using the scanners, to shut the scanners down. How about those TSA agents? Yeah, that's good. But how about those TSA agents, who, when they don't use the scanners, who take the opportunities they get to sexually assault whoever might catch their eye? There's a bill now in, Texas, in the Texas legislature to deal with those creeps, too. They'll put in a new provision in the state's sexual assault law. It's, it's part of the overall sexual assault law. And uh, if, if enacted, it, say, it would say, as part of a search to grant access to a publicly accessible building or form of transportation, intentionally, knowingly, or recklessly, A, if a person does this, if a person A searches another person without probable cause to believe the person committed an offense, and B, touches the anus, sexual organ, or breasts of the other person, including touching through clothing or touching the other person in a manner that would be offensive to a reasonable person, then that person will be guilty of what Texas calls a state jail felony. That means they'll be put in prison for 180 days or up to two years. Compare that to what the federal government does when someone uh, sexually assaults an innocent passenger. Nothing. Well, there's similar legislation in the works in New Hampshire and New Jersey, too. And if you want to learn more about those efforts uh, and get some ideas about what you might do to advance those, Ohio, uh, those ideas uh, in Ohio, in Kentucky, and in Indiana, uh, you should take a look at some websites those people in Texas have put together. They've done several. Uh, there's www.tsatyranny.com. There's www.supportdignity.com. And there's www.stopaustinscanners.com. Now, as that legislation moves forward in Texas, you can be sure that if it gains momentum, legal scholars will come and they'll weigh in and they'll say the states can't do this. They'll say it's unconstitutional for the states to do this. 
Which is pretty funny when you consider that most of these legal scholars are just fine with at least some amount of undeclared war, redistribution of wealth, restrictions on speech, pretrial detention, the presumption of constitutionality with respect to all other laws, and so on. To prove that it's unconstitutional, they'll point out that the Constitution doesn't actually say anything about nullification, and they'll argue that the U.S. Supreme Court would never say that nullification is okay. But of course, nullification is not unconstitutional. You can read the historical reasons in Tom Woods' book, and you should. And you should see also why, though, by just using your common sense. Supposedly, we're told the Constitution is the highest law of the land. Some people think this means that the Supreme Court's interpretation of the Constitution is the highest law of the land. But that doesn't make sense, because the Supreme Court is just as capable, as we know, of distorting or disregarding the Constitution's plain meaning, as well as any other part of the federal government. So if people in the federal government violate the Constitution, it can't be unconstitutional to hold them accountable under the law. They're criminals violating the so-called highest law of the land, so it's appropriate to treat them as criminals. The whole point of nullification is that the federal government must not be allowed to determine the extent of its own powers, because when it does, as we've seen, it concludes that there are no limits to its powers. Of course, arresting federal agents isn't the only way to effectively nullify a tyrannical federal law. One thing states can do is to simply refuse to aid the federal government in enforcing an unconstitutional law to do unconstitutional things. Some states and local governments have done just that with respect to the Patriot Act. As Tom Woods mentions in his book, some states have done this with respect to the Real ID Act. They've just decided we're not going to do this, even though you've told us we should. And state and local governments and ordinary people can do other things, legal things that won't get you in trouble, simply to make it more difficult for the feds to do their evil deeds. I like what the, uh, some of the librarians across the country did when the federal government decided that you know, under the Patriot Act it would go in and it would uh, look at people's library records to see what kind of books they've been reading, decide, to decide if they're suspicious people who they should look in on further. But what the librarians did was they simply destroyed all the patrons' old records so the government couldn't get to them anymore. They deleted them, they shredded them. There are many peaceful ways like this if we're creative in which we can peacefully resist the federal government and effectively nullify its laws. I strongly support nullification, but it's not really because I'm a fan of the Constitution. I've never been a big fan of the Constitution. We've had it for more than 200 years, and look where it's gotten us. It's given us the biggest, most powerful government in world history, a government that kills hundreds of thousands of people around the world, kills tens of thousands of people at home every year, indirectly and directly. You can say the Constitution's been distorted or partially ignored, but if it can be distorted or partially ignored so easily, what good is it really? Apparently it's not much good, unless a significant portion of the population cares about liberty and is vigilant about protecting its liberties. If people become conditioned, though, to the idea that their liberties come from government and exist only to the extent that the U.S. Supreme Court decides to recognize them, the Constitution is useless. And that's exactly what's happened in America. On the other hand, though, if people do decide to care about their liberties and are willing to fight for them, then they're going to demand them, and in the end they'll receive them, regardless of what the Constitution says. It's the people's consent or lack of consent that ultimately makes the difference, not a piece of paper. And that's why I like nullification. Nullification is really about withdrawing our consent. It's about declaring that we should be allowed to rule ourselves and not be ruled by masters in Washington. It's about rejecting the received opinion of our elites who tell us that things must be the way they've always been and that we should simply shut up and listen to our betters. It's about declaring that what comes first are our liberties before anything else, before, before any written document, and, before, and certainly before whatever's convenient for politicians and the powerful interests that finance their campaigns. More and more people are coming around to the ideas of libertarianism, including the idea that peaceful people should be left alone, the idea that government doesn't know what's best for everyone, and the idea that stealing and killing don't become okay just because the government does them. In 
Incidentally, I write about this growing movement and its ideas in my book, Libertarianism Today, which is available outside. <laughs> Nullification provides a vehicle for advancing these ideas that has a solid foundation in our history. And even if these particular campaigns to nullify unconstitutional law, to nullify this law or that law, don't pan out, they'll introduce many more people to this concept. This will help, this will help delegitimize the federal government and its claims to absolute power. It'll nullify the myths about our government that exist in people's minds that were taught from a very young age in our government schools. Nullifying the government's legitimacy in people's minds is the most important thing we can do. It's what leads to the withdrawal of consent from the regime of the sort that we've seen recently in Tunisia and Egypt. And we can have that kind of withdrawal of consent in this country too. Reaching people's minds, having them reach that point, that's what will allow us to win this thing in the end. Thank you.